everyone, my name is Daniel Skelton and I am the pastor at Dogwood Prairie United Methodist Church as well as Seed at Chapel United Methodist Church in Oblong, Illinois. And it's a blessing to be able to share the word of God with you wherever you are and whatever you happen to be doing. I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in and to join me for this week's message, for this week's sermon. And I, I pray that as I share the words that God has given me, I pray that these words impact your life in a positive way, that they fill your heart with love, they give your body strength, your mind wisdom, your, the, your spirit encouragement and determination and motivation to become the disciple that God has called you to be. I pray that these words, in essence, help you become a better disciple today than what you were yesterday. And every message that I put together and every scripture that I read to prepare for these messages, I always think, what is this text telling me about a disciple? How can this text be utilized to help me become a better disciple today than what I was yesterday? And so that's what I pray for every time that I share a message with, with you all, with my churches, or with anyone, is how can this message help us be a better disciple today than what we were yesterday. So I thank you for taking the time to tune in and to join me, whether you are a follower or whether you just happen to stumble upon this message. And if you have stumbled upon this message, um, it's because God needed you to hear this message. It's not, it, it, you can think of it as an accident, but God led you to this message for a specific reason. And again, I pray that that reason shines through in the words that he has given me to share with each and every one of you. So again, for the last time, thank you for taking the time to tune in and to join me. And I pray that this message impacts your life in a positive way so that you can become the disciple that God has called you to be. I like to start off my message recording simply by reminding us this, that the word of God is not just a one day thing. The word of God is not just to have, is not just to put on a shelf. It's not to be put in a tote and then opened up one day out of the week on a Sunday. No, the Word of God is meant for every day of the week. The Word of God is meant to be embraced, embodied, and experienced every day of the week. That's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and back to Monday. The Word of God is meant for every day of the week. Every week of the month, every month of the year, and every year of your life. So don't put the Word of God on a shelf. Don't put that, the Word of God in a tote or in a box and stash it away until the next week. Let the Word of God live live in your life. Let the Word of God be visible wherever you go and whatever you do. May the Word of God be on your lips, on your tongue, in your mind, in your heart, and in your body. The Word of God is meant to be experienced and embraced and embodied every day of your life. It's contagious when that happens, and you'll be surprised at how the Word of God can change the world. If you have a Bible nearby, I invite you to go ahead and open up that Bible to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And as you find your way there, I'm going to just kind of shed some light. We have taken a pause from our sermon series titled, What's Next? We took a pause uh, to honor the mothers in our lives. We took a pause last week to kind of commemorate and remember Alders, Aldersgate Day, the, the day John Wesley, the founder of the people called Methodist, his heart was strangely warmed and he realized that he could be forgiven of his sins and be set on the right path and walk by faith and not by sight. So we've taken a little bit of a break, a hiatus from our sermon series, but we're going to pick up where we left off. And where we left off was in 1 Peter. And we're going to continue to ask ourselves, what's next? You know, again, it's been a long time. Easter was way back in April, almost, you know, we're going to be approaching three months ago, but that doesn't matter. The resurrection of Christ can be experienced every day of our life, and it should be. Every day we should be resurrected with Christ in some way. Um, and so we're going to continue that, and we're going to continue to live out the resurrection today and for the next couple weeks, um, at least leading up to Father's Day. Um, and so, again, we're going to pick up where we left off. Our sermon, series titles is, our sermon series title is titled, What's Next? And for this sermon series, we're going to be looking at stories. We all have a story to tell. And First Peter gives us three instructions on how to tell that story. So this is First Peter chapter 3, and we'll be reading 13 through 22, and I'll be reading from the NRSV translation. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. This is what Peter has to say when it comes to telling stories. Now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear 
what they fear and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Maintain a good conscience so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight lives, were saved through water. In baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. This is the word of God for the people of God, and all God's people said, thanks be to God. Over the course of planning a wedding, I have learned a lot, a lot, and a lot about making lists. And most of the time, lists were given to me. It's not necessarily the list I was making, but I was given lists to do. But I've learned a lot about lists, what they mean, what they entail, how much weight they carry, and you know, the good things that can happen if I fulfill those lists. All through high school and college and seminary, I would be constantly making lists on a sticky notes and placing those sticky notes in places in which I would see them on a regular basis. So when it, come, when it came to wedding planning, making lists was, was not a new thing for me. I've been doing it for many years. It's part of who I am. I even had a, a pad of sticky notes in my car because making lists and keeping track of reminders was that important to me. Today, I still make lists. How many of you make lists containing things you need to do? Items you need to get, or even places that you need to go or want to go? All right, how many of you make lists? From the text we read earlier, from 1 Peter, Peter is calling us to make a list. However, this list does not contain chores or tasks. It doesn't show items that we desire to purchase or to get or to receive, and it certainly doesn't provide names of places that we want to go. Instead, this list proclaims our story, who we are, where we come from, and what we are doing today. This is the list that we need to be ready to share when, when asked to do so. Peter asked, what are we supposed to be ready to do? And our response is, tell our story. It's as simple as that, and it's as complicated as that. Today we embark on a journey with the resurrected Christ as he encourages us to tell our story. We might begin with what has happened to us, what struggles we have faced, or what journeys we have taken. Then we speak of our encounter with the risen Christ or the presence of the Holy Spirit, which has changed our life. And then, and then we follow with the decisions we made because of this encounter, right? We tell about who we are. Then we, we embrace that moment when we accepted Christ in our life and we say, you know what? I'm going to cherish this. I'm going to tell this story to others. I'm going to allow it to help me decide my decisions in life. Then, then, then we issue an invitation, right? We've, we've, we've built up this story. We, we issue an invitation that comes from the psalmist, and that invitation is, come and hear. Come and hear our story, right? That list of things that have happened in my life. The resurrection of Christ invites us to tell our story, and as we do so, we are called to make a list that helps us tell our story, to be ready to tell that story, and this list comes from 1 Peter, and the first thing we do is, don't be afraid to do what is good. Number two, seek a clear mind. And number three, we have a story to tell because Christ suffered for us. And when we do all those things on our list of when it comes to tell our story and how to tell our story, we realize that Jesus provides us hope 
to tell our story, and that hope is within us. I ask you again, what is your story? Moses had a story about leading the people to the promised land. Elijah had a story about restoring the people. King David had a story about fighting Goliath. Ruth had a story about risking her life for her family lineage. Abraham and Sarah had a story about becoming parents at an old age. Zachariah and Elizabeth had a story about becoming pregnant after being barren for many, many years. Joseph and Mary had a story about raising the Son of God. Pilate had a story about letting the people decide to crucify Jesus. The two thieves on the, on the crosses next to Jesus had their own stories. All the disciples had stories. Jesus had and continues to have a story. And even thinking of, and even talk, and even the talking donkey in Numbers 22 had a story, right? The Bible is filled with characters, with people, with animals, with things having a story. Believe it or not, the ark that Noah built had its own story about where it originated from, what it was called to do, and where it ended up after that mission. Right? The Bible is filled with stories. People are filled with stories. History is filled with stories. And these stories help us become the church and disciple that Jesus is calling us to be. So I ask you again, what is your story? Are you willing to place your stone, your story, on the foundation of Christ? What is your story? In April of 2022, professor and scholar James Papandrea republished his book titled Reading the Church Fathers, A History of the Early Church and the Development of Doctrine. And in, his book, and in this book, he includes a story about a shepherd who reminds us of how important our stories are to not only those around us, but to the church as well. Papandrea writes, the early church fathers, when considering the concept of stones, recall the story offered by the shepherd of Hermas, the brother of Bishop Poise I of Rome. The majority of the story is an allegory, a story with a meaning, just like the many stories in the Bible have meanings. It's a story of, of a tower which represents the church. The tower is still being built. It, it needs more stones. It needs more stories. And, and as stones are added to the structure, Hermes realizes that the stones are the people. You and I are the stones of this tower, of this church. Some are ready to be built into the tower with their stories fully developed, and they're ready to claim and proclaim their story. But others are not ready. They're a little bit reserved, holding back. Their story isn't fully formed yet. At the end of the age, the church will be complete and Jesus will return. Hermas, the shepherd of Hermas, tells us a story about stones, about you and I, and about how these stones and our stories help build the church of today. Stories are important to us. It's who we are. It's what God has created in our lives. Hermes is essentially telling us that we are the stones that help build the church of today and tomorrow. And Jesus is the cornerstone upon which we are laid next to. The church is still being built because people are still finding Jesus and still allowing him to be their cornerstone in their life and allowing him to help mold and create their stories. Just like you and I, every day my story is being molded and created by God. The stones, the stories, the heartbeats, the dreams, and the faith are what help build a house and a church. It takes many stories to build a foundation for other stones to rest upon. What is your story? Peter's encouraging us to think about our story and how our story can not only build foundations for future generations, but how our story can help us proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in our life. Peter offers three items that we should put on our list when it comes to telling our story. Three things we should do every time we tell our story to someone. First, when it comes to telling our story, we must not be afraid to do good. Peter states in verses 13 through 15, Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. 
And do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Right? When it comes to telling our story, we must not be afraid to do good. Let me repeat the opening question from verse 13. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? Well, Peter, I can probably give you a list. That verse seems a little naive, don't you think? People are, are hurt trying to do good all the time. Think of aid workers in times of war or those trying to help the hurting in a totalitarian regimes or those attempting to stand up against injustice, even in representative democracies who suffer persecution and misrepresentation on a regular basis. People are always striving to do good, but yet their goodness is often turned against them. We could come up with a list. Sometimes doing good causes more harm than we might realize, but what is our intentions of doing good? Right? Do good when you tell your story. But then Peter is aware of all that. He knows what's going to happen. He knows that we're going to try to do good and people are going to push back and tell us we're not doing the right thing. Which is why he moves on from verse 13 and immediately says, But, but, even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Maybe he is more aware of the world in which we live than it seems at first. And, and of course, he is. If this is Peter, or represents something of Peter's thinking and example, then yes, he does understand a complicated world. He does understand what's going on. Think about his life, right? He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He witnessed lame people walk, blind people see, the sick become healed, the outcasted welcomed home. He walked on water, even if, even if it was for only a few seconds or a few steps. He saw Jesus become transfigured. He figured out who Jesus was. And, and let's not forget that he denied Jesus three times. He saw how complicated the world can be. But he also saw how the stories of the people brought change to a hurting world. Jesus wasn't afraid to do good, and neither should we, because through our good deeds, we are blessed. Right? Through our good deeds, we are blessed. Because Jesus realizes that what we're doing is what we have been called to do. Peter goes on to say, don't live in fear. Don't hesitate to do good. John Wesley stated, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can at all the time you can to all the people you can as long as you ever can. Don't live in fear of your story, but allow your story, who you are, who God has made you to be, to bring good to this world. Don't be afraid of your story. Your story is you, right? Share it, proclaim it, live it out. Furthermore, don't let the threats cause you to not do what you know your faith calls you to do and to be. Don't let people tear you down or apart because of your story. It's your story. It's not their story. It's your story. Don't let them tear you down for it. And your story has been given to you by God and not them. Let me say that again. Your story has been given to you by God, not by others. God is the sole creator of your story, and you are the only one who can live out that story. Allow your faith to guide you to new places and dreams. It is a call to not be quiet, to not keep things under our hats, but to live out loud in a way that draws attention to what we are doing and who we are, and most importantly, to why we do what we do. This is a call to evangelism, to knocking on doors and telling our story and sharing the good news. Jesus doesn't want us to live in fear. After all, we are told 365 times in the Bible to not be afraid. Rather, Jesus wants us to be proud of our story and to allow our story to build up our faith and to be a source of comfort for others. As you learn to tell your story, you will give a defense to anyone who demands an account. And you will do so knowing that Jesus is with you. Some see that as, as an out, as a way to escape things. 
As long as no one asks me, I don't have to say a word. Well, we could also argue that the world is demanding an account all the time. No matter where you go, somebody is demanding something of you. Whether they say it directly or indirectly, the world is demanding something from you every day. Certainly, the brokenness of the world demands an account. The emptiness of the world demands an account. The hunger of the world demands an account. The sick in your home demands an account. We believe that we have what the world needs, which is why the, the world is demanding something from us. How dare we keep it to ourselves? When you tell your story, don't be afraid to tell it because the story was made by God, proclaimed, proclaimed by Jesus Christ and lived out through the Holy Spirit. Don't live in fear. Don't live in fear, but live in the goodness of Jesus' hopeful resurrection. Tell your story to do good things. Tell your story to change the world and to bring hope and resurrection back to the hearts of many. It's your story. It's not their story. Tell your story to bring goodness to all. Second, tell your story with a clear mind. Peter states in verses 16 and 17, Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Maintain a good conscience so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. Peter is quick to tell us how we go about telling our story and, and becoming a stone for God's kingdom foundation. Right? We don't tell our story with anger. We don't tell it with force or annoyance with tricks and sleight of hand. No, we tell our story with gentleness and reverence, Peter writes, and tell the honest truth as you know it. Don't make up stuff or, or you will get caught, says Peter. Don't say you're brave when you aren't. Don't, don't say you won't run when you will. Don't say you are perfect when you are probably, when you and probably everyone else knows you are far from it. You get the point. Tell your story with a clear mind. Tell your story the way Jesus would tell his story, and possibly your story, with truth, gentleness, and reverence. Peter says we speak with integrity. We speak as, as those who did not deserve the grace by which we live but who were baptized into a new life, a new way of living. We, we speak of those who are being made into disciples of Jesus Christ, not, not as those who have finished our labors, but are seeking to continue to do the work of God. Our story is not meant to be told with force or even forced upon anyone, right? This is our story. It's not their story. Our story does not have to be their story. Their story is their story. Our story, story is our story. Rather, our story is simply meant to be heard so that others may realize that who we are is who we are. We are children of God who have come with gentleness and reverence to remind others that their story matters and that, and that their story is embedded in the ways and works of Jesus Christ just like ours is. If we can't share our story with a godly and clear mind, then the meaning of our story falls short of the hope within us. If we tell our story with force, we may miss the important pieces that have changed our life. More often than not, most of those important pieces come from a state of feeling vulnerable, and possibly in times of suffering and pain. In moments of suffering, Jesus came and set us free, set you free. I remember hearing a quote that said, God does God's best work in our darkest moments. That is the context from which we speak, from, from which we give an account of the hope within us. And in dark moments, we find our hidden hope. Not by our own merits or our own goodness, but by the grace of God and Christ. If doing good for the sake of Jesus Christ leads to suffering, then that's what we need to do. It's embedded in our story. Our story has dark moments. Moments that we don't want to think about or even consider, but yet they have helped us become who we are today. Those dark moments have allowed God to do his best work in our lives so that we can begin to see the light. No matter how hard we try to eliminate the suffering in our life, to forget about those dark moments, to set it aside and carry on, 
it is still with us. Wherever we go, wherever we go, whatever we say, those moments are still within us. It is still with us because it is part of our story of who we are. Peter writes, yet if any one of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear his name. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. Yet if any of you suffer as a Christian, do not consider it as a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear his name. When you bear his name, your story takes a deeper meaning. And you realize that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you embrace your story, the good, the bad, the ugly, the joy, and the sadness, the blessings, and the sufferings, and allow the hope within you to help convey your story, the love of God will shine through because you have become a beacon of hope for someone else. Tell your story with a clear mind. Don't make things up. And love and goodness will be the hope of new beginnings. Don't be afraid to tell your story. Tell it with goodness in your heart. And tell your story with a clear mind. With a mind of Christ. Not a mind of something else. Third, and finally, we have a story to tell because Christ suffered for us. Let that sink in for a moment. We have a story to tell to proclaim, to share, because Jesus suffered for us, for you and for me. Peter states in verses 18 and 22, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He has put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Jesus suffered so that your story could be told, so that your story would bring goodness to many people, so that your story would bring hope to the hopeless, be a source of light in the darkness, and be an ever-flowing stream of love for everyone you meet. Your story is alive today because of what Jesus did on the cross yesterday and continues to do today. He suffered, he cried, he screamed out in pain, he said he was thirsty, and he breathed his last so that you and I would be set free, free from our sins, free to experience life and love, and free to tell our story. There, there is a song in the musical Hamilton that simply says, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? You tell your story. Others tell your story. Jesus tells your story. Your story rests in the hearts of all those who you encounter in your life. Jesus' suffering is the good news that reminds us of the hope within us, a hope that overcomes our suffering, a hope that builds our story today. Right? Our, my hope is built on nothing less than the story that God has given me. Because Jesus suffered, you have a story to tell. How are you living out that story? How are you sharing with others the magnificent and powerful spiritual endowment, blessed thing that God has given you through the sacrifice of his son? That amazing grace, that blessed assurance, that story. The psalmist in Psalm 66 tells a similar story. But instead of suffering, the psalm speaks of being tested as, as silver is tested. Indeed, the psalm speaks of all sorts of difficulties and struggles as, as having a divine origin. Yet the attitude of the writer is not one of frustration or anger, but understanding and willingness to praise. Remember, tell your story with a clear mind. That's what the psalmist is doing here. Rather than casting blame, the psalm suggests that there is no human experience that is outside of the will of God. There is nothing that can or does happen to us that a sign that God has abandoned us. He's always there. In the end, we could argue that the witness here is that God is present even in difficult times because he understands what we are going through. He suffered for us and he suffers with us. The good news of God's presence in the midst of pain and suffering is what adds depth and meaning and perspective and hope and restoration to our story. The result of this understanding is that the writer will speak of God's goodness, that's you. That's what the psalmist is writing about, the goodness, and that's you. 
The psalmist will tell what God has done for me. Like Peter's call, Psalm 66 says, We must be always ready to make a difference for hope that lies within us. For the story that God has given us, we must always be ready to share that story because it's the story that God has given us. And given the difficulties faced, there is no doubt that there will be those who will ask, How can you still have hope after what you've been through? After hearing your story, people will ask, How? How do you still have hope? How is your faith still where it is? And I pray your response is, come in here. Come in here, all who fear God, and I will tell what God has done for me. Right? Invite others to come and hear your story. Because again, it's a story given to you by God. It's the best story anybody could ever receive. It's the best story anybody could ever tell. Jesus suffered so that our story may continue. Jesus suffered so that our story may be heard. Jesus suffered so that our story, our legacy, may help change lives and lead others to Christ. Who lives, who dies, who tells your story, right? We will suffer along the way. But we will also give praise for what God has done for us because we are blessed. We have been given a righteous God. Somebody who truly cares for who we are and has developed a wonderful story within our hearts. Notice one more thing about this telling from 1 Peter. Nowhere does it ask us to count the numbers who believe us. We're not told to count everybody who comes to hear our story. Nowhere is there supposed to be a measuring of the response to the words that are spoken. Psalm 66 tells us that God has listened. In the end, that is the audience from whom we speak. That is the measure of our faithfulness. Not how many souls we have saved. Not how many times we've told our story. Not how many times we've told our story to people. Not how many people have heard our story. Not the crowds we drew or the attention we gathered. In fact, it may seem like no one at all is responding, is, is turning their lives around, is making any change based on our words, based on our story. That doesn't matter in the least. Yes, of course, we hope to make a difference in the world around us. We hope to bring influence for the cause of Christ and to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. But in the end, our audience is God. That's the important one. That's the one who truly needs to hear our story. God will take care of the response. Our task is to always be ready to tell our story whenever and wherever and to whomever. To tell it with goodness in our heart, with a clear mind, and with a realization that Jesus, that Jesus suffered so that we can tell our story today and every day. It doesn't matter if our story is heard to one person or to a thousand people. All that matters is that we're ready to tell our story when we're told to tell our story. Because that command is coming from God. And when God says, tell your story, there's a reason for it. Through the resurrection of Christ, we come alive. Through the resurrection of Christ, our story is heard. Our story is told. Through the resurrection of Christ, we have been given a hope within us that guides us to be the stone of the church as we help people become God's kingdom today and every day. Remember what that old hymn tells us. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. The church is the people, and each person has a story, and that story constructs the church. Don't be afraid to tell your story. And most importantly, always be ready to tell your story because you never know how your story can bring hope to someone else in your life. Jesus suffered so that you could tell your story. So tell it, proclaim it, live it, cherish it, let the world hear it. Because your story will not only help build the church, but it will help build the kingdom of God here on earth for generations to come. What is your story? Let it be so. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, through your resurrection, we are reminded that you suffered so that our story may be heard. O Lord, guide us as we tell our story to do good, to tell it the way you want us to tell it, and to be thankful for wonderful opportunities to tell our story. Because of you, O Lord, and all that you have done for us, we have a story to tell. Let us be ready to tell that story as we give honor and glory to you each and every day of our lives. All honor and glory is yours now and forever. Amen. If I could offer you a sermon takeaway, it's simply the question that I've been asking you throughout this entire message. What is your story? 
What is your story? What is the story that God has given you? How has God impacted your story, become a part of your story? And when you tell that story, do so without fear, but do so with goodness in your heart. Tell their story with a clear mind, with, with gentleness and reverence, and to realize that it's your story, it's not someone else's story. Don't let other people tear you, tear you apart because of your story. And remember that as you tell your story, you have the opportunity to tell your story because Jesus suffered for you. So what is your story? Who is hearing your story? Who should hear your story? And who needs to be reminded that they have a story given to them by Jesus Christ? What is your story? For the benediction, I remind you one last time, and I know you're going to be tired of hearing it, but what is your story? You all have a story to share, and your story is what builds the kingdom of God. After you tell your story, I invite you to simply say, this, this is my story, and it has been created by God. Do good, don't be afraid, and let your story bring hope and love into this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go living and experiencing the resurrection of Christ in your life and in your story. Remember, this is your story. Stick to it, and you will become the disciple that God has called you to be. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. May God bless you. May God's love and light shine down upon you as you continue to share your story, the very story that God has created for you, the very story in which Jesus suffered so you can tell, and the very story that the Holy Spirit is pushing you, inviting you to go out and proclaim to the world, to change one heart at a time. God bless you, and may God bless your story. Amen. Amen.